Today we're going to look at chapter three in our textbook. Uh, up to this point, we've learned how things move, but we haven't said anything about what causes them to move. And that's where chapter three comes in. Uh, chapter three is going to introduce the, uh, the mover force and how it relates to motion. And we have Isaac Newton to thanks, thank specifically for the laws that govern this motion. <clears throat> so let's see, we go to our PowerPoints. Here we go. There we are. The relationship between force and motion. Of course, Isaac Newton was the only one who was interested in uh, forces and uh, the effect that, that it has on motion. But he presented the, uh, the, the clearest explanation that was available at that time in the uh, early part of the 17th century, early to middle part of the 17th century. Uh, we can think of it as cause and effect. You know, if you have force, then you're likely to have motion. And uh, uh, like I said before, we'll look at Newton's three laws of motion. We'll also look at his, uh, the law that followed those three in which he laid down the mathematical relationship between gravity and the structure of the universe effectively, what holds the universe together. And then we'll uh, sidestep into concepts of buoyancy and momentum. All right, so uh, Isaac Newton was active. Uh, he was born in the early part of the 16th century and was active by the age of 20. He was very active in the, uh, what they called in those days, the natural sciences. <clears throat> uh, excuse me, they didn't even use science. They were, it was called the natural philosophy. That was their expression for science. <clears throat> and Isaac Newton uh, found himself in the middle of a great plague, uh, which, uh, periodically struck Europe and England in particular. Um, and at this time, if you had the money and a place to go, you left town, which is basically London, which was the biggest city in, in England at the time. And with the, the population density it had there, along with the rats and the fleas that carried the disease, um, and you had the ability, then you got out of town. So the rich folks, the ones who had the money and the ability, left town. And uh, so Newton did that, went to the country. And while he was there, he spent time in, um, in thought and experimentation. And basically came up with his, uh, his groundbreaking theory, groundbreaking laws uh, during this time, which is, seems to be a common pattern among scientists who actually distinguish themselves. Um, they do it in their early years. Uh, Isaac Newton did it in his time. Um, Einstein had created his uh, general theory of uh, uh, relativity in his early 20s. <clears throat> So here's Isaac Newton, and uh, by the time he was in his mid-20s, he had not only come up with these laws for physics, but he had developed a new math to enable him to do that, the calculus. Uh, uh, of course, simultaneously, there was German uh, Leibniz 
two develop the math at the same time. And in fact, uh, the math was identical. Leibniz and Newton's math was identical, but the uh, notation that we use today actually came from Leibniz. And when Newton published his masterwork, in fact, it was in two volumes, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, um, he did so in Latin. That was the common language among natural philosophers. When they communicated their work, they did so in Latin because it was a language that, that all educated people knew in those days. And of course, the, the title was in Latin. Uh, this is the English translation. You, it'll often be referred to as just the Principia, which is, refers to principles. <clears throat> All right, so we need to define some terms first. Uh, what do we mean by force? Well, uh, in the first place, force is a vector quantity. In other words, force is directed. It moves, it is applied with direction. Uh, so it's a vector quantity. And by definition, force is what is capable of producing motion or a change in motion. Notice that it's capable of producing motion or a change in motion. Um, it doesn't mean it always produces that motion. For instance, if I stand up to the wall and I press against it, I'm applying a force in a direction against the wall, but nothing happens. <laughs> right? I'm still applying the force and it's capable of producing motion, but it doesn't because the wall is too massive and, and uh, attached to the earth. Um, so that's an important fact. It's a vector quantity and it has the capability of producing motion or a change in motion. Um, so how do we know whether the, the force is sufficient to produce motion or change in motion? Well, it has to be balanced against any other forces that are pushing back. So here we have an example of a tug of war. We have this side's tugging one way and this side's, these people are tugging the other way, but they're tugging with exactly the same force, which means that there's no motion. The forces balance one another. But if the group on the right decides they're going to apply more force, then we have what we call a net force. That is, an, there is an unbalanced force in this equation, and it causes motion to the right toward the application of the greater force. Now, the total amount of force applied by the group on the right is not what causes the motion. It is balanced a certain degree by the force on the left, and what's left over is the force that causes the motion. That's the net force. So, Newton said, uh, actually, most sciences Actually, I should say all. All scientific advancement is based on history. Um, you've heard the expression, uh, so-and-so stood on the shoulders of giants. Well, that just means that uh, if, if I produce something uh, memorable or worth advancing science, I didn't just come out of thin air to do it. My work is based upon previous work. Now, the previous work may be wrong, and I demonstrate that with my work, or the previous work was right, and I just advance it further. So that's what Newton did. He took what was known in the past. Uh, he knew of the, these natural philosophers studied the classics. More than what they studied uh, all the information they had available to them as limited as it was, and they knew about Aristotle, they knew about the ancient sciences. Um, Aristotle had his theories, 
about the world. And one of them was that the natural state of matter was rest. And to a certain extent, that's still true. Um, but I'm not gonna beat that horse anymore. Just to illustrate the point that there was work that went before Newton. Uh, Galileo in Italy, um, uh, at the beginning of what we commonly call now the Renaissance, concluded that objects could naturally remain in motion indefinitely. Okay, so Aristotle said rest, Galileo said motion, and Newton put them together and said, actually, the first law says that an object, if it has at rest, it will stay at rest. Or if it's in motion, it will remain in uniform, that is constant motion, in a straight line, unless it is acted upon by an external unbalanced force. So Newton brought force into the picture. What causes a change in this restful situation or this uniform motion? The force does. Now in this case, that first law is just a statement of, of fact. It just says that this is what will happen, but it doesn't say how large the change will be. It just says for the first law, if it's rest or if it's moving, what is required is a, an external unbalanced force. Just as simple as that. It doesn't say anything about why, it doesn't give you any mathematical expression to evaluate it. So we can uh, draw some conclusions from that. And uh, we can consider what causes an unbalanced force. And in fact, since forces are, are vector quantities, they don't always just act in opposite directions. So this is force one and this is force two, and there's a balancing act there. Suppose now we have a force that's going this direction, and we have another force that's going this direction. What direction is the vector summation of that force? And how big is it? Well, to do that graphically, you just make a parallelogram out of this, right? Do that, you do that. This line is the same length as that one. This line is the same length as that one. And the summation, the vector summation of those two forces is this one. That's the total. Okay, so the, uh, the the summation of that, this is the force that's actually being applied in the first law. If there's a, a something at rest here or if it's moving, then this is the vector force that applies in that situation. Okay. So here's a practical question. Uh, the spacecraft that's orbiting a heavenly body, and in this case, we're showing an Apollo uh, command module and the service module attached together, um, orbiting the moon. So how is it that the spacecraft is not traveling in a straight line? Newton said, the first law says, if it's moving, then it will travel in a straight line. But it's not, it's in a curved, it's curving around the, the uh, moon. So there must be an unbalanced force that's acting upon that um, object in space to make it curve. So where's the force coming from? Well, actually the force is coming from the moon, the gravity. There's a gravitational pull 
a centripetal force directed toward the center of the body that is causing that uh, object to change its direction. Okay. So we've already established in chapter two that this object changing its direction in orbit around the moon is accelerating. It's accelerating toward the center of the moon. So if it's accelerating, then there must be a relationship between acceleration and force applied. Okay, that's where Newton introduces his second law. He is going to relate the force applied to the mass and this change in velocity, right? It's going the same speed, but it's changing direction. So the velocity is changing. Right? So um, I stuck this thing in here just to, to show you that <laughs> that boulder is not going anywhere unless a force very large acts upon it. All right. So we'll come back to Newton's second law in just a minute. First, we need to draw um, uh, the relationship between motion and inertia. We actually have to define inertia. What is inertia? Inertia is the tendency of an object to remain in its state of rest or in motion. Okay, and actually that concept was introduced by Galileo uh, sometime before Newton. But the, re the relationship here, um, actually inertia is a property of mass. Inertia is a fundamental property of mass and anything that has mass is going to respond to Newton's first law. It's the inertia of that mass that causes it to remain at rest or to remain in motion. So the greater the mass, the greater the inertia. They're often used synonymously. All right, so just an example, right? Uh, this girl can only push with a certain amount of force. She has a maximum force available to her. If she applies that same force to this little person, I assume her child, then that child's gonna move a lot further with the swing. Applying that force to this big guy who looks like a, her husband or, or maybe her brother, I don't know, her uncle, uh, but he's not gonna move as far. He has more inertia. So the same force moves a smaller mass further than it does a larger mass with more inertia. So there's a relationship there between force and inertia, or force and mass. Okay, that's what keeps this stack of coins stationary if we yank that paper out very quickly. Or you've seen the trick, uh, you have a, a place setting of uh, dishes and silverware and glasses and everything, and you see the trick where um, someone grabs the tablecloth and yanks it out from underneath everything and everything stays on the table, the tablecloth is removed. The reason everything stays on the table is its inertia. It wants to remain at rest. And the sudden removal of the tablecloth does not apply enough force to move those things. Okay. So here's Newton's second law, often called the law of inertia. It is, in fact, a mathematical relationship. Well, I, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, the first law is often called the law of inertia because it re references uh, motion or um, not motion, stationary position. Um, and which is due to the inertia that's associated with mass. Um, so that's the purpose of seat belts. They correct for this law 
if you're independent sitting in a seat and you're moving at a certain speed and the car suddenly stops, then your inertia is going to carry you forward. But if you strap yourself in to the car with seat belt and shoulder harness, you now have attached yourself to a greater mass. So you're now part of the whole mass of the car rather than independently flying around. So when you stop all of a sudden, um, you follow the same path as the car itself rather than an independent math, uh, path, which may throw you through the windshield. Okay. Now here comes the second law. Remember we said that there was an acceleration involved uh, and the relationship here is that the change in accel the acceleration of an object, the change in its velocity is proportional to the force. So double the force, you double the acceleration. That's what this symbol is right here. This symbol means proportional to. So acceleration is proportional to the force. More force, more acceleration. But it's inversely proportional to the mass. In other words, a larger mass means less acceleration. Right? So we say that acceleration is directly proportional to force, but inversely proportional to mass. All right. Mm -hmm. And the expression for that is usually written this way. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. OK, that's the most common way that you will see Newton's second law expressed. Now, you can rearrange that equation, of course. Right. And this is the arrangement that we see up here when we say acceleration is proportional to force and inversely proportional to mass you can say the same thing here the force required is um, proportional to mass and inversely proportional to acceleration um, no the other way around excuse me um, but you notice from this expression is if you have mass is constant, right, you're not going to change the mass. Then if we say that we increase the force, then we have to increase the acceleration. And if we, uh, to balance the equation. So if we look at what is constant, the constant is the mass. So let's solve the equation for the mass, right? So it'd be like this, mass is equal to force divided by acceleration. Okay. So leave that one there and put this one over here. Now, when we do it that way, then we see that we have a quotient, two variables in a quotient equal to a constant, mass. Whenever you see a quotient equal to a constant, you know that the relationship between these two is directly proportional. In other words, if this is constant, then if you make this one bigger, that one has to get bigger. If it doesn't, then you don't have the same relationship. If we double this one, we have to double that one. Okay, that's typical of any mathematical expression. A constant is equal to a quotient then the variables in that quotient are directly proportional to one another. All right. Now, if we say that the original situation where acceleration is a proportional to force and inversely proportional to mass, then we can say if we double the force, then we double the acceleration. So here we have going from this force to this force, then the acceleration has to double because the mass is constant. But 
if we change the conditions and say, now mass is not constant, say we're gonna double the mass, but with the same force as the first slide, then we see that the acceleration is cut in half. These are just different scenarios based upon this law, force equals mass times acceleration. Now, it's important to remember that this force is the net force, the unbalanced force, which is a vector sum of two or more forces. They may be directly opposite one another. They may be pulling the same direction, like the man and the woman in the previous slide. Or they could be at different angles, in which case the, the net force um, is somewhat more complicated. Now this mass and acceleration, it concerns the entire system. All right, <clears throat> so now let's uh, break for just a second and consider the units of measure. Right? The standard units of measure in the SI system for mass we know as kilograms, right? So kilograms goes here for the mass and acceleration is in meters and seconds. So that's meters per second squared. Remember acceleration is a change in velocity. So you have meters per second changing every second. That's why you have seconds squared. Well, by agreement and based upon this equation, the measurement of force is related to these fundamental units of kilogram meters and seconds as the Newton. So a kilogram times a meter divided by a second squared is equal to a Newton of force. Uh, and Newton then is considered a derived unit. So anytime you uh, are faced with resolving an equation that has force in it and the force is measured in newtons, then if you need to resolve that equation, but other components of the equation are in kilograms or meters or seconds squared, then you can uh, substitute kilogram meters per second squared for newtons in order to resolve uh, those units of measure in that equation. All right, so in this case, we're looking at um, a situation where you have a one mass here and a mass here, both the same mass, one kilogram each, they're tied together by uh, some tether that has no mass of its own, right? This is all theoretical. And the force applied in this direction on that mass is five newtons to the left. Remember that's negative. And to the right is positive eight newtons. And we wanna know acceleration. Well, first of all, which direction is it going to accelerate? Well, you need to know the balance. What is the balanced force? Well, if it's pulling eight this direction and five that direction, the balance is three newtons to the right, positive three newtons. So we know what the force is. We know what the total mass is because they're tied together, two kilograms. We can calculate the acceleration, right? Based upon Newton's second law. All right. So here we have mass one and mass two, which is the total mass of two kilograms. right, two kilograms. If we say that acceleration equals force divided by mass, right, we just have to solve the equation for the unknown. So we're looking for acceleration. So we have force divided by mass. So the force is three newtons here, and the mass is two kilograms, and two into three is one and a half. And I put this sign here, a positive sign, so that we'd know that the movement, the acceleration is to the right. But what does that mean? That means as long as this force is applied to the two kilograms, 
it will continue to change its velocity. Every second, its velocity will increase by 1.5 meters per second. So it will continue moving faster and faster and faster and faster as long as that force is applied to these masses. Now, what's the relationship of mass and weight? Well, we mentioned that in the first chapter with measurements. Mass and weight are different concepts. Mass is the amount of the substance. It doesn't change no matter where you are in the universe. Weight is a measure of force. And weight always assumes that the mass is in a gravitational field. In other words, it's being acted upon by another mass, pulling it toward that mass's center. So weight is a force. And we can apply Newton's second law to determine what that weight is. We know the mass. We know the acceleration due to gravity, right? We found that in chapter two. For the Earth, it's 9.8 meters uh, per second squared. Okay, so on the Earth, the weight or the force due to gravity is equal to the mass of that object times the acceleration of gravity. And we often, we often express that by substituting G for A. G means 9.8 meters per second squared. And W means weight. Now, if we were to do the same thing on the moon, we would have a different value of acceleration, right? Because the moon is a smaller mass. And in fact, we know that the, uh, the weight of an object on the moon will be about one sixth of that on the earth. What? Oh, you need a permanent marker. These are temporary. Here we go. Okay. So, uh, for example, suppose we want to find out what is the weight of 2.45 kilogram mass, first on the Earth and then on the Moon. Okay. So, we just need to solve our equation first for the weight on the earth. We know what the acceleration is. We know what the mass is. So we just substitute the mass and the acceleration here for these two terms. And we find out that on the earth, that mass weighs 24.0 Newtons. Or the conversion factor applied for us here is uh, 5.4 pounds will be 24 newtons. On the moon, the acceleration due to gravity uh, is different. It's actually one sixth of the acceleration on the Earth. So we just divide this value by six with the same mass. The mass didn't change. And now we know that the weight on the moon is only four newtons. Okay. So check our math. 24 newtons on the Earth and 4 newtons on the Moon is 6 times, right? So that just confirms that on the Earth, this mass it weighs 6 times as much as on the Moon. So what is G on the Moon, right? Well, 6 divided into that is 1.63 meters per second squared. Okay, now here is uh, the explanation for why Galileo was able to drop two weights from the Tower of Pisa and they both hit the ground at the same time. We would think that a heavier one would accelerate faster, but here's why they both hit the ground at the same time. Uh, if this book is a mass M and this book is a mass 2M, they're under the same 
acceleration, g here. Well, g is the same. It's a constant. And the mass is doubled here. So if g is a constant, then the force also must double, right? If it doesn't double, then g is not a constant anymore. So the force applied to these books is greater by twice than the force applied to this book. So naturally, uh, with twice the force, um, you would get twice the acceleration if it was the same mass, but it's not. It's double the mass. So the acceleration is actually the same for both of them. So that's why an object dropped in a uh, gravitational field will accelerate at exactly the same rate as any other object because g is a constant. Now, there are, uh, how do we get these unbalanced forces? Right? Well, you could have one force physically applied by some other agent, like two people pulling on the same rope, but there are other ways to get those uh, opposing forces, and one of those is friction. <clears throat> so what is friction? Well, we know that friction opposes any movement. If you try to slide a box across the floor, uh, you moved into a new home and you're trying to move things around, furniture, boxes full of things, you want to get them where they're going before you unpack them, then you either deadlift them or you put them on a hand truck or you slide them across the floor. If you slide them across the floor, you know it's harder because the friction is more. The opposing force is more. Friction is a resistance to motion that occurs anytime two materials are in contact with one another. Now, we won't talk about the theoretical basis for that, but there is one for this uh, attraction that resists motion. It's always there. Friction is always there. The hope, best we can hope for is to minimize the friction if we need it to. Sometimes we want the friction, right? If you grab hold of your steering wheel to make a turn, you want friction there, otherwise you <laughs> your hands are going to slide around the wheel and you're not going to make the turn. So friction is not bad. It just has to be applied in the right places and minimized in others. Right? We don't want a lot of friction inside the engine or motor in the car because that robs energy. Uh, we do want friction between our tires and the road when we turn because that applies the force that changes the direction of the car. But when we're rolling, we want as little friction as possible. So we want friction for turning. We want less friction for rolling, uh, getting the car what we want. Now, that's not the only source of friction in a moving vehicle. Right? Anytime you move a solid object through a fluid, you get friction. It's called hydrostatics. And anytime that air is moving across the car, uh, you get friction. And in fact, it increases as you increase the speed. So the materials can be any type. They can be two solids. It can be a solid liquid, a solid gas, a liquid gas, two gases. It doesn't matter. You always get that interaction that causes friction and, um, and opposition to relative motion. Um, okay. So there, there are two types of friction that we can identify. One is static friction. Um, and static friction is applied when there's no motion. Um, when you first try to start moving something, you feel more resistance than once you get it moving. That static friction is much higher, usually, than sliding friction or what we call kinetic friction. 
So once you get something moving, it takes less force to keep it moving. Um, that's why when you, uh, uh, in the winter, uh, if you're gonna go up a hill uh, and the surface is covered in snow and maybe a little ice, uh, you do not want to stop, keep moving. Because um, if you stop, then it takes more force to get you going again. And there may not be enough friction between your tires and the surface to, uh, to get you moving. Okay, there's a mathematical expression for uh, measuring how much friction you can expect between two contacted surfaces. It's called the coefficient of friction. And it's given this fancy little letter called, that's the Greek letter mu. <clears throat> now mu is, is used in physics for various types of variables. In this case, the mu uh, is an expression of a ratio between these two cons uh, uh, amounts. The applied force that's parallel to the surfaces, that's what this two lines means, applied force parallel, ratioed to the force that's pressing them together with this perpendicular mark. That means there's a force bearing down, holding these things to surfaces together. And the ratio of the force required to move it this way, there's your surface, and there's a force applied here, right? That's your parallel force. And there's also a force here. perpendicular to the surfaces. This one is like that, okay? The ratio of those two together is equal to mu. And notice that this force is in Newtons and that force is in Newtons. So this coefficient is a dimensionless number. It has no units. <clears throat> <clears throat> and in this case, we just say the force, and this one is N. Now, this N doesn't mean Newtons. That N is derived from the word normal. Normal in mathematics and physics means perpendicular to. So this one refers to the perpendicular force, normal force. And this is the applied force parallel, right? So if we, if we take this and we say, uh, there's a person here. Well, actually he needs longer legs, doesn't he? And he's pulling, right? He's pulling with a certain force here, right? How much of that force is applied parallel? Well, in that case, all of this force is not being applied. Actually, some of it is being applied this way, which balances that one. And the other force is being applied this way, which accounts for this one. So there you have another vector problem. And you have to solve what's the angle here. How much of the force is here? And how much of the force is here counteracting the normal force? Right? So these problems can get complicated in a hurry. All right. Um, now, when you first start to move that object, it's going to be subjected to this static friction. Before things move, you have to overcome static friction, and that applied is a mu sub s for static. Once you get it moving, then you have mu sub k applied, which should be 
a lesser value. It takes less force to overcome friction. Now, uh, and that's what this expression means. The, uh, these values are operationally defined. In other words, uh, it, you, it isn't easy and in many cases impossible to determine what the mu is based uh, solely on theoretical application to the problem. It has to be experimentally determined for each pair of substances. So if you have uh, um, a box on a wooden floor, that will be one value. But if you have a box sliding across a different surface, like carpet versus hardwood, it will have a different mu. And that has to be determined experimentally. And we have tables and tables and tables of those values. Aluminum on aluminum is uh, static is 1.9 mu, which is pretty high, and 1.4 mu for K, uh, mu sub K. And we have different, uh, like um, steel on steel, right? If it's lubricated, like if you put a thin film, film of oil between them, then you get a reduction for both. Or if you have a substance like Teflon, which naturally has low friction, put two Teflons together, you get a very low coefficient of static and, in this case, they're essentially equal, both the static and the kinetic the coefficients of friction. Um, and then if you introduce the, uh, to the scenario, uh, rolling friction by using ball bearings, in other words, between the two surfaces, you put little steel balls between them. Then you get a, a marked reduction in the coefficient of friction. That's why so many uh, mechanical devices uh, introduce ball bearings into their bearing surfaces. Uh, the problem with ball bearings is, well, the advantage is they have very low friction. So uh, that's good. But the forces that are being applied to those ball bearings are limited because there's very limited contact between the surfaces. So if you apply too much force to those surfaces, you can get a collapse. In other words, the ball bearing can either dig into the rolling surface or it can crack the ball bearing. So they have limitations there. Uh, if you're going to apply huge forces to a bearing surface, then plane bearings are better for load bearing because you spread the force out over a large area. So in that case, you have a plane bearing that's lubricated. And that in the in automobile engines, the bearings where the crankshaft, uh, the crankshaft here is bearing on parts of the motor that hold the shaft together, then these bearings are plane bearings and there's oil under pressure that's being driven into that surface between the two. So that would be applied here where lubricated steel. But where you don't have a lot of force and you want to minimize friction, you can use ball bearings. Just two comparisons. Okay, that's Newton's first law, Newton's second law. Newton came up with a third law. He didn't apply a formula to this one either. It's just a statement of fact. Newton said that for every action, there was an equal and opposite reaction. In other words, uh, if I'm standing on a, a, if I've got Teflon shoes and I'm standing on a Teflon surface, then there's very low friction, right? So we can essentially assume that there's no friction. If I take a heavy weight and I throw it that way, the action is the object being thrown that way, and the reaction is I'm going back the other way. 
Another way of saying is, is if an object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts a, an equal force in return. Right? So look at it this way. If I'm standing on the Earth's surface, then there is a force that's being applied to my body by gravity. Right? If there were not an equal and opposite force holding me up, then I'd travel to the center of the Earth. So there's an equal and opposite force being applied against my body in the opposite direction. So force, counterforce. Um, or uh, have you ever seen a, a cannon fired, right? When the lanyard is pulled and the charge is ignited, the cannonball goes out the barrel. What does the gun do? The gun goes back the opposite direction, right? Force, counterforce, equal opposite reaction. Or when you shoot a gun, uh, you feel a kick to your shoulder. That's the opposite reaction to the bullet's motion out the barrel. This can be expressed as uh, force one equals the negative force two, right? And that can be reduced by Newton's second law to uh, mass one times x acceleration is equal and opposite to the mass two times its acceleration. So what does that mean? Well, that means if uh, the bullet travels out the gun, it's a certain mass and it's accelerated to go out the gun, then it's gonna push back with a force. Well, how far is the gun gonna move? and the force applied to the recoil. Well, it's a heavier mass, so the acceleration of the gun is going to be less. And if the gun is attached to me, that even adds more mass. That's why they say, hold that gun tightly to your shoulder. That cements your mass with the gun. So the higher mass means you move less for the same force. Uh, if you hold the gun out away from your shoulder, it's just the gun, and it's going to kick back and slap you in the shoulder, maybe even break it. <clears throat> All right. So here we have an expression of Newton's third law based upon his second law. So the mathematical expression is not the third law itself, but it's an interpretation of the third law in terms of the second law. This is the whole, the reason that, that rockets and jets work. <clears throat> so when those gases are exhausted out the back of the rocket or out the back of the jet engine, that mass of gas is traveling at very high velocity, but the gas doesn't weigh very much. But since it's moving so fast and it's been accelerated to that velocity from zero to um, hurricane force wind, then there's a huge amount of force available for the reaction. And the reaction drives the rocket or the airplane forward. That's why um, rocket engines work in space, right? Because they carry with them both the fuel and the oxidizer, and when they ignite, they produce this equal and opposite reaction. Uh, okay, so I, I mentioned this concept of gravity before. <clears throat> if you jump off a table, you will accelerate to the Earth. In actuality, as you move toward the Earth, the Earth is moving toward you because you are applying an attractive force to the Earth while it's attracting you. The fact of the matter is, though, that the Earth is so big, um, you, you can't even measure the movement of the Earth as you move toward it. So your mass is small, so your acceleration is great. The Earth's mass is huge, so its acceleration is very small. That's the whole concept 
um, uh, behind the gravitational gravitation uh, tractor. So everybody's heard about the um, earth killing comet that may at some point uh, be headed to earth. Well, uh, how do you move it? Well, various methods of changing the course of a comet so it won't strike the earth have been proposed. And one of the most elegant ones is if we find out the comet is headed our way far enough, then what we do is we send a spacecraft out there. So here's your comet and we send our spacecraft out there and they attract one another with an equal and opposite force. Well, if this spacecraft is applying a force to the comet, it's moving it off of its trajectory. Maybe it was headed this way. Now we're changing its course by this gravitational tractor. And if it's far enough away, it's a very small force, just a fraction, a minute amount of Newtons. But over time, it is large enough to move that comet off of its course. All right. So I mentioned earlier that um, uh, if you're gonna make a turn, you do need friction between your tires and the road because they provide the necessary centripetal force that causes centripetal acceleration, right? If you have this force applied to the mass of your car, then it will produce an acceleration. <clears throat> and you can look at it in different ways, right? You can look at it in terms of the first law, right? The car wants to keep going forward and you want to keep going forward with it. But if it changes directions, what's gonna happen? Well, if you're not strapped into the car, if you're not part of the car's mass, then you will tend to move straight the way you were going while the car moves this way. That's why you end up leaning over against the glass or the door. Or um, uh, if you do happen to lean over against the door, you're applying a force to the car and the car is applying a force to you. Third law, equal and opposite. Now, after Newton presented his three laws, of uh, motion, he wanted to uh, understand as best he could why this was happening. He never came up with a, an explanation for why these forces attract heavenly bodies to each other. Um, eventually, he settled on the <laughs> action at a distance. In other words, I don't know what it is. It just happens. <clears throat> but he knew that gravity was a fundamental force of nature that attracted. And he said that every object in the universe attracts every other object in the universe. That's gravity. The size of that attraction, the force of that attraction is based upon two things. How big are the objects? What is their mass? So he had to incorporate the two masses into his formula. And then he says, how far apart are they? That also influences the force of gravity, right? So he came up with this law of universal gravitation. And in words, it just says that every particle in the universe attracts every other particle with a force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses. So there's one mass, 
there's the other mass, directly proportional. So if this mass goes up, force goes up. If this mass goes up, the force goes up, right? And it's the product of the two. But he said it's also inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So an inverse proportional of the square of the distance puts it in this term. So if this term gets bigger, then this term gets smaller. Right? So that's the relationship of the two. Now to put it in an equation, he needs a fudge factor. And the fudge factor is big G, which is the universal gravitational constant. There it is, G. Now, how do we know what, what G is? Well, we know that force is in newtons, correct? And we know that this mass is kilograms, and we know that this mass is in kilograms, and we know that the distance between them is in meters squared. All right. So here we have these units and this, but we know what newtons means, correct? Because newtons is equal to force times acceleration or um, no, this is force, excuse me, mass times acceleration, which is kilogram meters per second squared. That's a newton. Kilogram meters per second squared, equal to these two. Okay, so this is kilogram squared divided by meters squared. So now we can say, what are the units of G? Well, G has to be such that we cancel kilograms, right? So we need kilograms down here, cancel one of those kilograms. And we need mass on top. Right? So if mass is on the bottom, we need mass cubed. So this cancels those two and leaves one behind. And then we need uh, second squared. So second squared goes on the top. So meters cubed, second squared per kilogram should be the units of G. Now, if I did that right, I hope I did that right. The fudge factor should be, well, okay. So they're incorporating Newtons here. All right, let's do it again. If this is Newtons, right, Newtons, then we need to have Newtons over here. And we need to cancel meter squared, so it's in the numerator and kilogram squared in the denominator. So Newton meter squared per kilogram squared are the units for G. Now all we need is the number. So if we know what the force of gravity is for this, these two masses and that distance, we can calculate G. But um, it's only an estimate. A, a, an accurate measurement of G was not determined for another 70 years after Newton passed away. And that happened when Henry Cavendish actually used an instrument that was designed by John Mitchell, used that device to measure what G is. All right, and I've got a little video. Uh, it's important to remember that G, this big G, is not equal to little g. Little g is uh, acceleration, meters per second squared. This G is a fudge factor for Newton's uh, law of gravitation. So I got a little video here coming up. Here it is. Um, Well, I thought it was going to give me, I, I need to, shoot. Uh, 
Well, I had a picture of the device. Maybe it'll show up. I'll, I'll get it. We'll look at it in a minute. But let's watch this video and hopefully it will explain some of the mechanics involved in Cavendish experiment. Determining gravitational constant. English scientist Henry Cavendish in 1798 was the first one who experimentally determined the value of universal gravitational constant G. In Cavendish's experimental setup, two equal small lead <coughs> spheres A and B, each of mass M, are attached at the ends of the bar AB of length L. The bar AB is suspended from the ceiling. Large spheres S1 and S2 are brought close to the small masses M at A and B from the opposite sides. The larger spheres S1 and S2 attract smaller spheres A and B by equal and opposite gravitational force. It gives rise to gravitational torque F into L, which in turn twists the suspended wire through some angle theta. However, a restoring torque of the wire also comes into play, which opposes the twisting of wire from its equilibrium position. Mathematically, tau into theta is equal to F into L. On solving it, we can calculate the gravitational constant as G is equal to tau theta D square upon M M L, where D is the distance between the centers of neighboring small spheres and large spheres. Presently accepted value of G is G. Okay, so there's the value of G calculated <clears throat> by Cavendish and confirmed uh, over the decades uh, by more refined experiments. Um, I'm not sure if I got available the picture, but you don't have to remember this mathematics here. That's, that's not important for our discussion. It's just to, to illustrate the fact that this value can and was actually determined experimentally in the lab by um, Henry Cavendish. Here we go. Now this is a recreation. This is a modern recreation of the experiment uh, using uh, modern materials. So here you have the very large masses here, there, and the small masses are located down here somewhere inside, there we go. And this, this uh, wire suspends those two small masses and experiences a, a turning force that can be measured um, as an angular displacement. And with some of those, those calculations, you can actually determine what G, the value of G is. Okay, so it's not important that you know the math, it's just that you recognize that how delicate the experimentation was required uh, to determine the value of G. Now, once you know what G is, the sky's the limit with that calculation. I mean, you can determine the attractive force between the moon and the earth, uh, between the sun and the earth, uh, between any two planets, you can determine what the force of attraction is. Now, you may wonder, well, these two spheres are also experiencing the attraction of the earth against them. And so are these two small spheres. So why don't we take that into account? Well, the fact of the matter is, they're all experiencing the same force of gravity from the earth, so it cancels out. That's why Cavendish used two, these pairs of large spheres and small spheres. So they would cancel one another out in the gravitational field of the earth. If he had only used one each, then he would have had to somehow account for the gravitational attraction of the earth influencing those single spheres. But since he used pairs, then they balanced one another out and he could ignore those uh, the influence of the Earth's gravity in this experiment. All right, so let's move on. Here we go. Um, so if you have two masses, then uh, the 
Third law says they're going to attract one another with equal and opposite force. And that force is measured and calculated with this formula, the Newton's law of gravitation. Okay. So we can say, um, what is the force of gravitation between a person at the Earth's surface and the Earth itself? Well, it's important to, we have to introduce another concept. It's called the center of gravity. For objects that are, they can be touching, but they can't be melded together. They can only be touching on their surfaces for this to work. If they're melded together, then you start influencing each object by the mass past uh, as it passes by. Now you've got mass on either side, so you can't do that. So as close as you can get is just the surface of the object. But as long as you're on the surface or away, then the distance between them uh, is the person to the center of the object. That is the center of gravity the theoretical point from which all mass of that object emanates. Okay, so for a uniform sphere, of course, that will be the geometric center of the sphere and the distance between them will be the radius of the Earth, right? So radius of the Earth here is the distance between them and in our formula, that would be squared. And then the mass of the object is your mass say I would be uh, about 50 kilograms. And then the mass of the earth was, is something else, whatever that is. Um, in fact, it might be easier to calculate the mass of the earth here, knowing G, my mass, the radius of the earth, and the force of gravity. What is my weight at the surface? Then I could solve for the mass of the earth. Okay, let's say we have these two objects, one kilogram mass and a two kilogram mass, and they're one meter apart. What's the magnitude of the gravitational force between these two masses, right? It's a very small force. And at the surface of the earth, of course, they're being pulled by the earth, but we wanna know what's attracting each other together. And for these purposes, um, we can ignore the force of the earth because it's equally applied to both of them. So we're interested in what's attracting the two together, right? So we just need to apply what we know, the, the universal constant, gravitational constant, mass one, mass two, the distance between them squared, and it's a simple calculation, right? So the attractive force between the two is 10 to the minus 10th Newtons, very, very small force. I easily overcome. Okay. <clears throat> Force of gravity on the Earth's surface. So you have the mass of the Earth and its radius. You have the force that we know, the weight is equal to the mass times acceleration. This is from Newton's second law. So if we combine the second law with the universal gravitation, maybe we can get some more information from that. So if this is equal to the weight of the object and this is equal to the weight of the object, right? Then this expression is equal to that expression. And notice that this small mass cancels out, right? It's the same on both sides, so it cancels. And then we can solve for the acceleration of gravity. And G then, that makes G independent of the mass of the small object, right? The only thing upon which G or acceleration of gravity uh, depends is the mass of the object and its radius. Right? So that's important. If you want to know what is the um, acceleration at the surface of some other heavenly body, 
you need to know its mass and its radius. And if you can calculate those two, then you can determine what the acceleration of gravity will be at the surface of that object. Now here's an astronaut, probably in the uh, International Space Station, um, doing some work on a computer, and she appears to be floating. And you can, you can tell also that her hair is standing up because <laughs> the gravity is not holding it to her head. But the question here is, um, is there gravity acting upon that person? Well, yeah, there is gravity. She and the spacecraft are accelerating toward the center of the Earth, right? But they're moving so fast that the, uh, the, they're falling toward the Earth, but they're moving away from the Earth at the same rate. Okay. But they, they're in, we call it microgravity. The gravity is still there. But because of their speed, they are, are moving away from the Earth at the same rate as they're accelerating toward the Earth. So there's a, a fundamental value, a speed, at which an object in, uh, in space, ideally, is moving at just the right speed so that it's free falling at the same rate as it's accelerating toward the Earth. So if it's moving slower than that, it's eventually going to drop to the Earth. And it's, if it's moving faster than that, it's going to move further away from the Earth. And at a certain point, you have an escape velocity at which it leaves the orbit of the Earth. In other words, it's, your speed is so fast that you're uh, compensating in excess of your motion toward the Earth. And um, that value then sends you not into orbit around the Earth, but into orbit around the larger body that the Earth is also orbiting, which was the Sun. And that is the basis of uh, uh, celestial mechanics and, and navigation, movement in space, is knowing those values. All right. Now we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about buoyancy. So everybody has something of a, uh, an intuition about buoyancy. In other words, if you jump into a pool in the summer, preferably, uh, you will usually float. Now, why do you float? Why don't you just sink to the bottom? Well, there's a force holding you up. And that force is supplied by the fluid in which you are immersed. And that buoyant force is equal to the amount of fluid that you displaced. So if, if I weigh uh, 210 pounds, which is about 50 kilograms, then 50 kilograms of water must be displaced in order to buoy me up. Um, now, that principle was discovered by Archimedes, um, an ancient scientist uh, in Alexandria, Egypt, as a matter of fact. And the, the story is told that Archimedes was uh, taking a bath and he discovered this principle while taking that bath and he hollered, Eureka, I found it, and hopped out of his bath and ran down the streets naked. <laughs> I don't know if that story is true, but uh, uh, he discovered the principle of buoyancy and worked on that problem further to try to explain uh, how it is that the displacement of that fluid uh, buoyed him up. Archimedes principle, there it is, it's given his name. Now this can happen in any fluid. I've just been talking about uh, immersing or, or jumping into a pool of water, but it can happen in gases too, right? 
if you uh, fill a, a balloon with helium, it displaces a certain volume of air and the volume that it displaces applies that buoyant force to the balloon. Now, if the balloon is, is, uh, uh, has a vacuum inside, then the total force of that displacement is applied to the balloon. But you can hardly get a vacuum in a balloon like that. So you fill it with a gas that weighs less. So you've, you've displaced a certain amount of volume. This volume you've displaced of air and the mass of air that you displaced applies a buoyant force. But the balloon also weighs, right? So it's got a gas in here and it's, it's got another force. So if this force is greater than that force, the balloon will rise. Now there's another principle about buoyancy that simplifies the matter for us. It's called density. We've discovered and used that concept of density. So uh, the displacement of a certain weight of a fluid is dependent upon the volume that's displaced. And if we displace a certain volume based on its density, then there's a um, density equals mass divided by volume. So if we displace a certain volume of it, it's related to the mass of how much is displaced. And that is related to density. So if you know an object is a certain density and you know the fluid is a certain density, then all you have to do is compare the two. If the density of the fluid is greater than the density of the object, it will float because it will sink only so far as to displace the same amount of volume that is related to its mass or the force applied to it. And when it gets to that point, it'll stop. It doesn't have to go any further to balance the downward force of gravity against the upward force of the displacement. So you have some left above the surface. And in that case, you know that the only way that that can happen is for the density of the object, the density of this one, uh, one, two, the density of this one is less than the density of the fluid. So that's why when we say um, oil floats on water, oil is less dense than water. So it floats on the top. Some of it pushes into the water until it displaces enough water uh, to uh, produ provide the buoyant force. Now there's also the concept of uh, oil and water don't mix, but, <laughs> but uh, as long as they, we don't force them to mix, like uh, making a salad dressing, then the oil will float on the surface because it is less dense than water. Salt water is more dense than fresh water. So if you uh, jump into the, uh, the Dead Sea on the eastern border of Israel, then you will float higher in the water because you don't have to displace as much of it to provide the buoyant force. So instead of, instead of floating like this, it float like that. Okay. Okay. Um, then that begs the question, um, why does a ship that's made out of steel, which has a density of 7.8 grams per cubic centimeter, float in water that only has, seawater that only has a density of 1.03 grams per cubic centimeter? You would expect the ship to sink. Well, <clears throat> um, that only takes into account the density of the steel. 
the combined density of the ship, steel and trapped air inside the ship, uh, makes the combined density of the ship less than 1.03 grams, right? So the composite density of the ship is much less than the water. Otherwise it wouldn't float. And that's why when a ship that's made out of steel has a breach in it, like the Titanic when it struck the iceberg, then it filled with water and it lost that buoyancy. Right? Because the air inside the ship was part of the ship. But when you fill that up with water, then now you have left is the steel and it is more dense than water and down she went. All right, cream floats on, cream is basically oils, less dense than milk, so it floats on the top. Um, and the, the concept of buoyancy is fundamental to the operation of a submarine. So if a submarine wants to sink, it just takes on more water and displaces the air that gives it a, uh, a lower density increases its density enough to the point where it will sink. And when it does that, uh, it sinks down to a certain depth until the densities are equal. Now, the density of water at the surface is 1.03 grams per cubic centimeter. But water, even though water is very, we often think of water as incompressible, at depth, it does tend to, to be compressed and uh, the density of water will vary with depth based on compression and based upon uh, temperature as well. So it's a balancing act with a submarine, very delicate balancing act. Okay, now that's buoyancy. There's a theory behind that, why buoyancy works, but uh, we don't have the time or the, or the need in this course to enter that discussion. Now we're gonna move on to a concept called momentum. Momentum is a uh, derived, uh, it's a mathematical expression, actually. Momentum is, in, in our first discussion, linear momentum, is mass times velocity. So mass times the velocity of an object is equal to uh, momentum. Sometimes it's given a P, sometimes it's given this Greek letter, which is rho. In this case, we're using rho for uh, partial momentum. And then the big P is for a summation of those partials. But mass times velocity will give you linear momentum. And that means this mass, kilograms, times meters per second, means that um, linear momentum, linear momentum is kilogram meters per second. Okay. Um, there is a, a, a law in physics, and it's called the conservation of momentum. In this case, the conservation of linear momentum. In other words, when any uh, two masses interact with one another, the momentum before the interaction, you might say collision, is the same as the momentum after the collision. So here's the initial momentum, the total of the momentums, the partial momentums, and here's the final momentum, and they have to be equal. Here it is, conservation of linear momentum. And this is just stated. 
the total linear momentum of an isolated system remains the same if there's no external unbalanced force acting on the system. Okay, now in this case, we I've uh, bolded isolated because I want to explain what I mean by isolated. Okay. Um, this is another way of saying linear momentum is conserved during a collision. In other words, it does not change with time. Okay, so now this, this digress for a moment. <clears throat> and define our terms. What is a system? A system is any part of the universe that you define. It's what you focus your attention upon for the solution of a problem. So in that way, um, the system can either be defined for you by the problem, or if necessary, you can define the system yourself. Whatever is required to solve the problem. Now, what's left over? Everything that's left over is surroundings. Okay, and uh, ultimately, the system is defined and everything else in the universe is surroundings. But sometimes it's more convenient to uh, define the extent of the surroundings as well. And we can do that. So there's our surroundings, there's our system. And here we're going to limit the extent of our surroundings. Okay, we put a barrier there. So no interaction between the system and the surroundings with anything else in the universe. So we can describe uh, this arrangement of system and surroundings with three different terms. If it is an open system, then both energy and matter can be exchanged between the system and surroundings. Energy can cross the barrier, matter can cross the barrier. That's an open system. A closed system will not let matter cross the barrier, but energy can cross the barrier. Okay, an isolated system is one in which neither matter nor energy can cross the barrier. So in this situation, your focus is entirely upon the system, right? So whatever happens in the system stays in the system. All right, so now that we've defined our terms, um, uh, we're gonna get to this again in chapter four, because in chapter four, we introduce the concept of energy and work. So don't forget that. Bring that forward with you into chapter four. Okay, let's get back to momentum. Here's an example of a guy jumping off a boat, right? Uh, Newton's third law says this action, uh, this action of jumping produces a reaction in the boat, right? Uh, but that can also be described in terms of momentum. So the man's forward momentum is equal to the boat's rearward momentum. They cancel one another out. Now the question is, <laughs> is he gonna make it to the rock? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but their momentums must cancel. In other words, um, they have to be equal and opposite so that the, uh, conservation of momentum is conserved. That's redundant. Linear momentum is conserved in this interaction. Uh, here's an experiment that can be conducted in the lab. Right? You have two masses, kilogram mass over here and a uh, kilogram here and two kilograms here, and they're held together by this thread against a compressed spring. So there's, there's a force being applied, but it can't act because they're being held together. So if we break that tie, then the force is going to be applied and they're gonna move apart. 
the momentum here would be two kilograms times its velocity. And this one will be uh, one kilogram times its velocity. Okay. In this problem, we're given the velocity of the smaller mass, 1.8 meters per second. And the mass is one kilogram. So that has a momentum of 1.8 kilogram meters per second. That means that this object must also have a momentum of 1.8 kilogram meters per second, but it's a larger mass, right? So um, what do we know about that? Well, we know this is given information and we know that the momentum of one has to equal the momentum of the other one to conserve, right? So the momentum of one uh, by the definition of momentum, mass one times velocity one equals the negative value since they're opposite of mass two times velocity two. Right? So if we solve those together, we find that this momentum divided by the mass of the second one is equal to the velocity. But the, the um, mass one and velocity one are moving to the right. So they have to be positive. But the mass two and the velocity two are negative because they're moving to the left. So that's why the answer is uh, minus 0 0.90 meters per second because the acceleration, I mean the, the momentum of the second mass is to the left, which naturally means it's negative. So notice here that uh, we doubled the mass for the second one, and we cut the momentum in half from 1.8 to 0 0.9. Okay, that's the way jet propulsion works, and it can be explained uh, by the third law, but it can also be explained by linear momentum both of those actions come into play. The third law is just descriptive. The law of conservation of linear momentum allows us to calculate the effect of one force, the expelled gases, versus the movement in the opposite direction of the jet engine. Okay, so momentum has to be conserved. If the gases are moving out of that engine at a high velocity but low mass, then the higher mass airplane will move at a lower velocity in order to balance the terms. Momentum is conserved. All right, the next concept, which uh, involves force, It's called torque. Torque is an expression of twisting. The effect caused by a force that's applied um, so you have this bar and a force applied and a, a distance here from the center of rotation. Okay, so when that force is applied to this bar, there's a torque applied to it, and it's related to that force and that distance. And this is an unbalanced force, just like always in the past. If there's an, an opposite force being applied from some other direction, then you have to consider what's the, the, uh, the net force before you can calculate the torque. <clears throat> so um, what would be an expression of torque? In this case, torque is equal to, let's see, I'm not sure, what is their, uh, what are they using for the variable applied to torque? Just a capital T, okay? So torque 
is equal to this force times that distance. And that's called the lever arm. This is the lever arm. So this will be in meters and this will be in newtons. So torque is measured in newton meters. And um, anybody who's ever used what we call a torque wrench, when you're tightening a nut, uh, particularly on, on some bolt on a car, then you set it, you, you tighten it. The old fashioned time uh, had a, a twisting arm on it. So when you pull down, that arm would, would rise up and it would be marked off on the end of that beam and you would trick until it got to a certain point and stop. Now they have um, torque wrenches that you can set for a certain torque and you pull on it until it clicks and you've reached the torque. But that bolt or whatever is, is here at the center of rotation is tightened with that force to that lever arm. So naturally you can apply more force or you can make the lever arm longer and get the same torque with less force. Or you can apply more torque with a longer arm, lever arm in the same. So um, when I'm trying to remove a bolt from my lawnmower, say, I want to change the blade. Sometimes it's been on there for a while and doesn't want to come loose. So I put my wrench on it. And then I've got a what they call a cheater bar. So I have my wrench here. wrapped around that nut. And then I have a cheater bar that goes out like this. So I can apply force with a, a longer lever arm and it applies more torque to that bolt. Okay. So um, that's the concept of torque. Now we want to transition that torque into uh, momentum. Our earlier discussion had to do with linear momentum. It was simply a force applied to a mass. But if we apply that force in a circular motion, we get angular momentum. Okay. And that requires a torque, right? So if the uh, satellite is moving around uh, a planet, then the um, we can calculate its angular momentum based upon how far it is from the Earth and the forces applied to it uh, perpendicular to that uh, lever arm, which is the radius of its orbit. Or uh, in this case, you're applying a torque to a steering wheel. So you have a force on one side with this hand and a force on the other side with that hand. And you have a radius here for that force and a radius here for that force. And you can apply the formula and find out what the total torque is. It'll be torque on this side. And since they're moving in the same circular direction, there's also uh, an additional torque in the other direction. So there's your lever arm, right? So if you increase the lever arm, if you double it, then you double the torque. And I've already discussed that, so we're not going to beat that at, uh, horse anymore. <clears throat> this um, relationship, conservation of angular momentum, has been known since 14th century. or is described as early as the 14th century, uh, the law of conservation of angular momentum. So 
um, one way to look at that is um, what is the angular momentum of a skater that's in a spin? Now the arms way out, they're spinning kind of slowly. They bring their arms in and they speed up. Why is that? Well, there's a certain angular momentum applied to a skater as they're spinning like this, but when they move, they reduce the R the length of the lever arm, then conservation of momentum has to be maintained. So they have to spin faster to maintain that momentum. Um, and the example is not just the skater, but anything that moves in circular motion. <clears throat> <clears throat> the formula that governs angular momentum, and instead of T, T is um, uh, the, the simple expression of uh, torque as um, a force parallel to the lever arm produces a torque that, and uh, uh, that references the, uh, uh, the simple machine called a lever. But angular momentum for uh, a satellite in motion or a rotating object um, is expressed as L to tell them apart. So L is angular momentum, T is the uh, uh, rotational momentum. And L then becomes mass times whatever velocity. Uh, the object is moving times the radius of that motion. So let's look at um, what are the units of measure for torque are Newton meters, correct? So that's torque. All right. Uh, linear momentum, excuse me. Uh, linear momentum is uh, force. Excuse me. I'm getting my concepts mixed up. We've moved from torque to back to momentum. We had linear momentum, which was um, uh, mass times velocity. So linear momentum is uh, a mass times velocity or uh, kilograms meters per second. Okay, kilogram meters per second is linear velocity, linear momentum. Angular momentum is L, which is mass times velocity times the radius. So this is mass, kilograms, this is meters, per second, and this is meters. Okay, that's angular momentum. Mass, velocity, radius, angular momentum. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. No. My mistake. This is force. No, no, that's not right. I had it right the first time. Mass. <clears throat> Mass times velocity is linear momentum. Angular momentum is mass times velocity times radius. Okay. So here we have uh, mass, you know, we have velocity and distance to the center of motion. So the units are kilograms, meters squared, meters times meters squared, divided by uh, seconds. So those are the units of measure for angular momentum.
Let's go back to linear momentum just for a second. Let me back up. Yeah, there it is. Mass times velocity. So those are the linear momentum units. These are angular momentum. Okay. So conservation of angular momentum also means that uh, before and after must be equal. So we have mass times velocity times radius before, mass times velocity times radius after. So if, you're, if your radius decreases from here to here, then velocity has to increase. So that's why the skater spins faster when they pull their arms in. We can also look, that, look at that in terms of um, uh, the, the orbit of a heavenly body, right? And we're gonna find out uh, when we get to discussions of Kepler's laws that most orbits of planets, well, all, all orbits actually, they move in an ellipse, right? Not a circle. Some are very close to a circle, but they're always elliptical. So at some time, the planet is at a greater radius than it is at a closer radius. So when it's out here, way, way out here, uh, say a comet, then way out here, it's moving at a certain velocity, a very slow velocity, great distance. But as it gets closer to the sun, in order to retain its momentum, its angular momentum, the velocity must increase because the mass didn't change, but the distance did change. So that's why as a comet approaches the sun, it speeds up. Okay. And even in the Earth's orbit, when the Earth is closer to the sun, uh, it's going to be moving faster. Uh, we'll get to that in, uh, let's see, chapter 16. So that's down the road some. Uh, we'll talk about Kepler's second law of planetary motion. So just, that's a teaser for, <laughs> for later on when we get to astronomy. Okay, here's an example of a comet. At 900 million miles away from the sun, it's moving at 6,000 miles an hour. Right? So it has, um, a mass times this radius, this distance, times its velocity, gives it a certain momentum. So what's its speed at its closest point, 30 million miles away from the sun? Well, we know that its momentum out here is gonna be equal to the same momentum when it's close, right? So there we are, but the mass is the same, right? So the mass cancels. Right, mass cancels out. So we really only have uh, velocity times radius, velocity times radius, right? We don't care what the mass is because it cancels out of the equation. We just plug in the numbers that we do know and we, we solve for the velocity, which at its closest approach, it has increased from 6,000 miles per hour to 180,000 miles per hour. Right, so that's 30 times faster. All right. Now, you ever wonder when you, when you watch a helicopter, um, what is the purpose of the spinning blades on a helicopter? Well, if the helicopter only has one central lifting blade, as that blade turns this way, then an equal and opposite uh, torque is going to apply to the helicopter to turn the other way. So if you spin the, the rotor this way, the helicopter is gonna be going the other direction. And you can't have that. <laughs> the helicopter needs to be under control. So if it's a single rotor, they usually put a tail rotor that's spinning in such a way as to produce an opposing force to counterbalance that torque from the main rotor. But 
if you want all the lifting power, all the energy from its engines to go into lifting, then what you do is rather than spend energy in that counter rotating propeller, you put two main rotors, one moving in one direction, one moving in the other, and they counteract each other. They, op they rotate in opposite directions. So you get all the lifting power by using two counter-rotating uh, rotors on your helicopter. That's why these, these types of helicopters can lift so much more weight than a single rotor helicopter can. All right, uh, and this is just a discussion of the figure skater. Okay, uh, let's see, there we go. <clears throat> and uh, we discussed that earlier. When they pull their arms in, they're decreasing the radius. So naturally, uh, R1V1 has to equal R2V2 since the mass didn't change. And in order to do that, then the velocity has to increase. So you have to spin faster to maintain your angular momentum. Okay, these are the equations that were covered today, right? Newton's second law. Uh, this is a derived equation that Newton didn't present, but it's valid. Equal and opposite forces for the third law. Then we have his law of gravitation. Right? We have the gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. The Newton meter squared divided by kilogram squared. We have um, acceleration due to gravity. We have linear momentum and conservation of that. Then we have angular momentum. And all you have to do for angular momentum is just add that radius out there. And there's conservation of angular momentum as well. And that's it. Those are all the equations that are introduced in this chapter and that you'll have to remember for that for the exam on chapter three. All right, that's it for chapter three.